in addition to misleading or deceptive conduct, the Australian consumer law also prohibits unconscionable conduct. Now you remember from our section on consent that an unconscionability deals with unfairness. And unconscionable conduct around um, transactions and contracts is where someone takes advantage of the special disadvantage that someone else has, um, which is closely akin to having a really superior bargaining position and an unfair advantage in the bargain. A lot of what the unconscionable conduct provisions, section 20, section 21 and 22 provide for are a reinstatement of, or a restatement of the common law um, that's already been set out. And that's even acknowledged in the words of the sections as we go through. So there's not going to be a lot new in what we talk about here. There's going to be some clarifications, uh, a case or two, and uh, a little bit of explanation around uh, some examples of what unconscionable conduct might actually be. Okay, so again, we need to look at the particular words of the section uh, because that's where the basis of the law is. And what we see here is that section 20 provides that a person must not in trade or commerce engage in conduct that's unconscionable within the meaning of the unwritten law. So really it's taking the ideas from common law um, that we talked about in the um, Amadio case, the Commercial Bank of Australia and Amadio, so you might want to revisit that from our consent section. And it's applying them to the business context. Now you'll notice some, some similar words here to the section uh, 18 that we've just been through about um, deceptive and misleading conduct, that it's about a person must not in trade or commerce engage in conduct. So everything we talked about, what is conduct and what is not conduct, and also what is in trade or commerce and what is not in trade or commerce applies. You have to go through those steps, engaging in conduct, conduct in trade or commerce. And then the meaning of unconscionability is what is in the common law through the Amadio case, and that's how it works. So there's the three elements. So while section 20 deals with unconscionability generally, in section 21, we're dealing with the supply or acquisition of goods or services. Um, it ex exempts publicly listed companies. So what this really has the effect of is uh, governing those situations where an individual or company um, is dealing with another individual or small business during um, the negotiations and during the deals. So we can see that as well as the general prohibition under section 20, we have section 21 applying for whenever we have business deals to worry about. Again, we don't have the definition of unconscionability in 21, but section 22.1 sets out a whole series of examples of what unconscionability um, can be and can include. And they include things like the relative strengths of the bargaining positions of the people in the transaction, whether the customer could understand the documents uh, around the goods or services they were buying or being supplied, whether there was undue influence or pressure or unfair tactics used by the business against the customer or by the supplier or by anyone acting on their half, by an agent. The amount for which and the circumstances under which the customer could have acquired identical or equivalent goods or services. So if there's gouging going on, it, it probably shows unconscionable conduct. And the extent to which the conduct of the supplier was consistent to how that supplier would act with all other customers. So if there's uh, an anomaly with, uh, with customer A, it, it, it tends to show that they had a special advantage, um, an unfairness in the bargaining that they took advantage of, which would lead us to conclude it was unconscionable conduct. Again, section 22.1 is not exclusive, but there are a set of things to actually look at when we're thinking about what is unconscionability. Um, often a case can help us think about this, so let's have a look at the ACCC and Kershaw. So it's a pretty straightforward case where Kershaw was selling educational materials to Indigenous communities. Now, many people in these Indigenous communities, many of the customers, um, suffered 
from particular disadvantages such as uh, illiteracy, maybe health problems, even language issues. And he took advantage of those particular special disadvantages that the customers had and also the general lack of commercial experience of the customers in those areas of the Northern Territory. So for instance, in lots of cases, um, he sold them things which weren't relevant or weren't needed by the children of the people who were buying them. And people always want to do the best by their children. So they'll, they'll, they were told that this stuff would help, um, that it would be great for the kids, but it really just wasn't suitable. Worse than that, they, they actually signed up to an open-ended uh, payment system where they kept getting billed each month uh, after, and he would supposedly supply them um, with materials in an ongoing basis. But in many, many cases, he continued to get uh, these sums of money from the arrangement well after the time when they paid the full price for all of the goods that they'd been supplied. I mean, clearly that's unconscionable conduct um, under Section 21 of the ACL.